Sally Damore, Liebe Gruss, or Love's Greeting. Let's see what we can learn from Sir Edward Elgar's romantic short composition. Through analysing the arrangement, melodic construction and harmonic language, we will attempt to devise our own broader lessons from Elgar's composition, Salut de Mort, that we can then take for ourselves as composers. These main lessons will be how the melodic material we need might lie in the material we already have or have come up with first, and secondly, how our opening sections are an inescapable foundation for our compositions. Heavy. I suppose the other lesson we'll learn, more pervasively, is how to write music to woo, as it is nearly Valentine's Day after all. Salut de Moore is a composition for solo violin and piano, and it was composed in 1888. A piece of the late 19th century, and composed in his early 30s, opus number 12, it is an earlier published composition of Sir Edward Elgar's. Dedicated to his fiancée, Caroline Alice Roberts, the dedicatee name on the score, Carice, is her first and middle name, Caroline Alice, combined. Incidentally, Carice also became the name of their first daughter. Carice, or Caroline Alice, was fluent in German. For this reason, the original title, preserved by publishers as the subtitle, was Liebergruss, uh, the German for obviously Salut de Moor and Love's Greeting. This title was changed by publishers to the French translation Salut de Moor, presumably as they felt it would be more popular with their customers. The composition Salut de Moor is in a ternary structure, where the outer sections use similar melodic material. These outer sections also usually share the same key, particularly in the music of this period and earlier. Looking at the table, we can see that this is true of Elgar's Salut de Moor. The outer sections are in E major, while the middle section is in G major, a chromatic median, the flattened third scale degree, relationship with E major. The outer sections use the same melodic material, albeit slightly varied, while the middle section presents new melodic material. However, regarding the melodic material, Elgar links the two themes of the A and B sections together, which we'll look at in the next section. I am always amazed by Elgar's concision when it comes to melody. He was remarkably economical in his control of melody and motif, and Sally Damore demonstrates this in a shorter form composition. I have extracted theme 1 from Sally Damore. I have also laid each of the phrases of theme 1 out vertically. Similar to John Williams' melodic construction in Fox Phoenix, we can see the first two bars, what we might call the antecedent, uh, of each of the first three phrases are alike. The only variation in these bars comes in bar 7, with the melodic chromatic alteration to the note B to B sharp. The fourth phrase's first two bars are different to the other phrases, which is unsurprising for a melody. Often, in melodies like this, there is a phrase that breaks the repetitions or similarities of earlier phrases to complement them and round them off. However, despite these differences, we can still see faint similarities between phrase 4's first bar and the other phrase's first bars. Melodically, the contour intervals are different, yet Elgar preserves the melody rhythmically using a crotchet quaver and quaver rhythm. Again, omitting phrase 4, we can see that the second two bars of each phrase, 1 to 3, are very similar again. Each using crotchets in their respective third bars, Elgar alters where the melody goes each time. The repetitions of the earlier parts of each phrase, which we have looked at previously, create a form of anticipation, which Elgar leverages in bar 13, or the third bar of phrase 3, to elevate the melodic climax. The final bar of phrase 3 leads into the fourth phrase using the same crotchet quaver, quaver rhythm as the opening motif of the melody, but the descending step melodic contour of bar 15. These are important links to the second theme which we'll discuss next. Looking at the melody of the B section, which is in G major, we can immediately see Algar's economy at play again. Most of the bars contain the crotchet quaver and quaver rhythmic cell mentioned in our analysis of the first theme, and more importantly, it appears in the form introduced at the close of theme 1. Accentuating the link between the themes beyond the rhythm, Elgar introduces the stepwise motion at the end of theme 1. The stepwise crotchet quaver and quaver rhythm becomes a fundamental motif of theme 2. Motivic in construction, the second theme comprises subtle permutations of this fundamental motif, maintaining the stepwise motion and rhythm 
Elgar alters the contour of each motif, weaving them into a longer melody that is both different, complementing theme one, but also linked to that theme, giving us continuity. The harmony Elgar uses for Salut de Moore is largely diatonic, with some chromatic inflections. The harmony is also very functional, with the application and explanation via Roman numerals being relatively straightforward. Looking more closely at the first theme of Salut de Moore again, we can see the opening phrase utilises the stablest of stable progressions, a homely 1, 1 first inversion, 2 7, 5 7 1. Nothing says homely like a 2 5 1 progression. The opening section of the music establishes E major, and the use of diatonic functional chords sets the tone of the short composition. One way in which Elgar inflects and brings chromatic harmonic colours into Saladomor is by using secondary dominance. Extending our analysis of this section further, Elgar uses some secondary dominance in bar 7, 9 and 13. In bar 7, Elgar uses a 5 of 6, in other words, a major median chord in E major, G sharp major. This G sharp major chord also happens to be the dominant of E major's relative minor, C sharp minor the chord used in bar 8. Similarly, in bars 9 and 13, Elgar uses major chords for what would normally be minor triads in E major, also having them lead onto uh, the relative tonic chords. For example, from bar 9 into 10, we have an F sharp major, supertonic, falling into B major, the dominant, or 5, of E major. And for bar 13 and 14, we have C sharp major, the submedian, into F sharp minor, the supertonic of E major. Typically, the supertonic and submedian, the two and sixth respectively, of a major scale are minor. Elgar alters them chromatically to create secondary dominance. Another chromatic device that Elgar uses is the diminished seventh chord, which can be a functional acrobat. Limited in transposition, the same diminished chords appear similarly and enharmonically in several keys. Therefore, they can be the key link into a great many different tonalities of varying distances. Elgar, in this composition, Salut de Moore, uses them like secondary dominance. For example, in the first repeat section, at the end of section A, Elgar uses an A uh, diminished seventh chord leading onto a B major chord, which sets up a repetition starting in E major, which we go back to obviously via the repeat marks. Using the same diminished chord in the second repeat section, but this time as a C sharp diminished 7, the chord acts as a pivot into G major, the key of the middle section. Both chords act as 7 of 5, first of E major leading on to a B major chord, uh, the dominant of E major, and then secondly of G major. However, rather than going to the dominant of G major, a D major chord, at bar 21, Elgar moves to a tonic G major 6-4, or second inversion chord, keeping the bass note as a dominant pedal point on the note of D for the next eight bars. Lest we get bogged down in the ploughed fields of harmonic theory, let's think about broader lessons we can take from today's analysis of Salut de Moore. For instance, the use of secondary dominant chords, diminished chords, and how Elgar constructs and links melodies. What can we learn from Sally de Moore as composers? A way in which we start a composition sets up everything we do subsequently. Elgar here clearly wants the harmonic language to be concise, but he also wants it to be pliable enough to allow the chromatic inflections and the larger scale chromatic medium modulation to G major. To do this, he is careful to inject secondary dominance, uh, which keep the harmonic language functional, but not a lead weight. Elgar is careful to set up a starting point that allows for some structural movement without that movement being stark or surprising. In essence, what I'm saying is the use of chords in the opening establishes the vocabulary of Elgar's short story. Beyond tonality, this could be a more chromatic or atonal language. It could be modal, dissonant or consonant. This is not to say the music could not become more dissonant if it starts consonant, more tonal if it starts chromatic, atonal or modal. Rather, the introduction is the point from which we depart, and what it does establishes the whole essence of the piece. In the case of Elgar, we have a rounded composition. We move away and return. However, in another composition it might be more linear. We might move away and never return. The piece could be a process of increasing dissonance or consonance. Fundamentally, though, we cannot escape 
the starting point, it is the listener's point of reference, and although we might not compose it first, the composition develops from it. The other lessons we can learn from Elgar is that the building materials we need for our composition may well lie in the built materials we have. For example, the link we identified between Elgar's two melodies for Salut de Mort. Now I do not know how Elgar composed these, one way could have been that he had two melodies already in the opening and middle section, and to round off the opening melody he used the motif of the second and injected it into the first. Another way in is that he may have identified the motif that closed his opening melody and took that as the basis of the second melody. Or he may well have identified the rhythmic quality of his opening motif and used that as an improvisatory anchor for composing the second melody. At which point he might have gone back, like with point one, and used the new stepwise motif as a means of rounding off the main melody. It's difficult to say which is what and what is which, however I do not think it matters to us here. The lesson we should take is that we may have the answers to our composition questions already. Assume we have a melody, for instance, for our composition, and we want to use it in a larger ternary structure. The answer for our second melody could and maybe should lie in that first one. <laughs>